Good morning, and welcome to the Aspire Challenge, Ask Me Anything. We're looking forward to an engaging conversation as you learn more about the areas where we would like to work with you as part of a fruitful interactive research team. I, I am Anthony Newton. I'm the Innovation Operations Lead for the Information Directorate. I'm joined here with Heather Hage, the president and CEO of the Griffiths Institute, our closest partner in our journey to reach out and engage the broader technical community. So Heather, are you excited about our Innovari mission and the Aspire series? Anthony, absolutely. Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us today. We are building Innovari Advancement Center to engage the best and brightest scientific and entrepreneurial talent beyond DOD boundaries to converge on critical technology challenges that advance the state of the art and enhance the technical advantage of the Air Force and Space Force in the air, in space and cyberspace. I want you to know that at Innovari, we are focused and we are motivated to accelerate warfighter solutions in artificial intelligence and machine learning, cyber, nanoelectronics, neuromorphic computing, quantum, and UAS technologies, and to establish the goalposts, vision, and galvanize the resources to bring to life the new technologies needed to serve the airmen and guardians who protect and advance our great country. Only together can our government, academic, and industry players meet this mission, and this is where we start. Today, you will have the opportunity to hear from and engage the Air Force technical leaders who created and will manage the individual challenges that we need to solve, and we need your help. All right. So just to give you an idea of what's in store, there are three theme segments in today's event where you will learn, where you will get to meet the challenge authors, you'll have time to ask questions of those authors, and then we're going to allow time for you to network both with the authors and with the other participants to talk about those challenges. In addition, we are going to have two keynote speakers who will talk about the benefits they've achieved by partnering with the Air Force through the Information Directorate. Heather? So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Dr. Alvaro Velasquez, who will talk about our first two challenges in transfer learning and hierarchical planning. Dr. Velasquez, please. Uh, yes, am I audible? Yes, you are. Very good. Um, so hello, everyone. Uh, this, uh, I'm very excited to be involved in this Innovari collaboration. Um, the first topic that I want to talk about is on developing transfer learning solutions for decision making or control problems. Uh, now, we've seen in the in the literature that the area of transfer learning, which is to say, the area of taking some surrogate uh, source of data and leveraging that um, to bootstrap a learning model for some other target task. Uh, this has been tremendously successful, in particular in the areas of computer vision and, and natural language processing. In computer vision, for example, uh, we have some ongoing work through our Streamline ML program at AFRL, where if you have a, an environment where there is a lack of data, you can first take something like ImageNet, a very popular data set, you can train your learning model, freeze all of the earlier parameters that were learned for your learning model, and then simply fine tune some of the later parameters over uh, your target data set. Perhaps it's some kind of sensitive aircraft for which we have very little data or some such thing. Uh, so transfer learning has been very successful there, not just in the academic setting, but in, in the military setting as well. And of course, in natural language processing, we've seen the, the rise of the state-of-the-art language models, uh, things like transformers and, and hierarchical attention networks, where you can train over, for example, Wikipedia, learn the uh, syntax and semantics of the English language, and then fine tune for some relevant application, perhaps something like uh, Air Force tactical chat or, or some such thing. Um, so the success in these two areas of computer vision and natural language processing, this lends credence to the possibility that we might be able to do the same within decision-making problems. Uh, in particular, decision-making introduces at least two challenges to the adoption of transfer learning. 
and that is that you have an agent acting in some environment. And so the actions that the agent takes, this changes the future data distribution that the agent will observe. For example, if you have some simulation environment where an aircraft shoots down an enemy aircraft, of course, you will not see that enemy aircraft again. Uh, this is vastly different from what we see in computer vision and natural language processing, where the result is sort of immediate and there is no change in the data distribution. That's challenge number one. Um, challenge number two is the fact that the agent has to reason about a long-term objective. These are sequences of actions that lead to mission success. It's not an immediate inference like you would have in computer vision. In computer vision for a classification problem, you know, you see an input image, is it a face, is it not a face, and you're done, right? Uh, of course, I'm oversimplifying things a little bit, uh, but when you look at decision-making areas like reinforcement learning and planning, where we've seen tremendous successes, you know, we've seen the defeat of the World Go champion, we've seen uh, superhuman performance in some Atari games, uh, we've seen uh, world-class performance in poker, StarCraft II, Dota II. Um, there are very strong analogs between all of those problems uh, and some of the problems we face within the military. Um, but we have a very, very big hurdle to overcome. These are very data expensive, data hungry methods. And when you look at our MNS tools, which would be our natural platforms for adopting uh, decision making solutions, things like AFSIM and AWSIM, these run on the order of minutes to hours. Uh, when you consider that the state of the art, for example, the AlphaGo system that beat the World Go champion requires tens of millions of instances uh, to learn a, a, a human level or superhuman policy, we're clearly not going to run these simulations for tens of millions of hours. It's completely intractable. So one of the most promising solutions, I believe, is to come up with novel transfer learning solutions by which we can leverage a surrogate environment that is much faster than AFSIM or AWSIM, something that runs on, on a sub-second runtime, um, which can be done using tools like OpenAI Gym, uh, PySC2, et cetera, and learning over the surrogate environment and developing a novel transfer learning mechanism by which we can transfer what was learned there to a high fidelity, tried and true uh, platform such as AFSIM or AWSIM. So that is the ethos um, of this topic. And that includes not just the development of the novel transfer learning mechanism, but also a means by which we can reason about the similarity between the two environments in question. Uh, if you use some environment like StarCraft or you come up with your own environment, can you establish some kind of similarity metric by which we can say, yes, we can do transfer learning from this surrogate environment to let's say AFSIM or some other environment? Um, I'll conclude by saying that I understand uh, prospective performers may not have access to high fidelity Air Force tools such as AFSIM or AWSIM, so we're not restricting ourselves to those platforms. You could perfectly welcome up with transfer learning solutions as well as similarity metrics for, say, transferring from an open AI gym environment to some other open AI gym environment. Um, I believe I've used up more than my five minutes, so I'll, I'll conclude there and I look forward to uh, answering any questions. All right, awesome. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Velasquez. Uh, hopefully I said that correctly, I apologize. Um, so I wanna make sure that uh, everyone online knows how to use the functions of the site and how to ask questions appropriately. So on the right side of your screen, you'll see various icons. One of them is chat, one of them is attendees, and one of them is questions. If you click the questions uh, tab, You'll be able to type any questions that you may have, and then I will read them off uh, to the leader of that specific section of the event. So I'll give everyone just a couple minutes to, to load up their questions. In the meantime, I think you still have, if you have anything else you would like to talk about, a few minutes on the agenda. Well, I have a second topic that I, should I talk about that now, or am I answering questions first? There's no questions loaded up just yet, so I think you can, you can go straight into it. I'll proceed to the next topic. So the second topic uh, that I've been working on, I call hierarchical heterogeneous uh, planning. So the sort of spirit of this topic is that um, we, we really need more uh, mathematically grounded models when we reason about a lot of the Air Force problems that we try to reason about and, and, and really just military in general. Um, for example, uh, as, as you all may know, JATC2 has become a very popular sort of paradigm and demand signal, joint all domain command and control. Um, and I suspect that when two P 
people talk about JATC too, they may not be talking about the same thing, right? Uh, oftentimes we use very hand wavy language to explain what we're saying. Oftentimes we may not even uh, know exactly what we are referring to when we speak about things like JATC2 and other uh, relevant problems. But when you mathematically ground these things in a model, then you know exactly what you're talking about. The math speaks for itself, right? If you were to formalize, for example, the maximum on ground problem, I'll talk more about this in a second, you could give this to an academic who has no idea what maximum on ground is because the mathematics is there. And that's, and that's really the key thing. Um, I feel like we need to mathematically ground the language by which we speak about Air Force problems. Uh, going back to maximum on ground, it, it can be presented very straightforwardly. I'll use that as an example uh, of what I mean by hierarchical heterogeneous planning. In maximum on ground, you have a set of aircraft and you have a set of airfields. You want to assign the aircraft to airfields to be processed and then they'll, they'll go on, uh, on their mission. And the objective is to minimize the number of airfields used. Seems like a fairly innocuous problem. Um, it's actually, it, as we've been told by our Indo-PACOM stakeholders, it's one of the most important, often overlooked problems uh, in air mobility. So it's actually, it's actually quite important. Uh, when you try to mathematically formalize this, for example, you vectorize the wingspan of the incoming aircraft, you vectorize the capacities of the airfields, you present this as a network of potential matchings of aircraft to airfields, and by doing that, not only have you mathematically grounded this such that uh, a technical person can immediately apply solutions to it, um, but more importantly, you'll notice that this reduces to a very famous problem that has been studied for over 40 years. In this case, the bin packing problem. Why does that matter? Because now we can bring in 40 years worth of results into this very important Air Force problem. We don't have to reinvent the wheel. Uh, from the bin packing literature, we now know that maximum on ground will be actually an NP hard problem, which means that an efficient solution is not likely to exist. But we know that there are good, efficient approximation algorithms to get arbitrarily close to the optimal solution very quickly. Uh, we also know that as we bring in more complexity, for example, if we don't want to use just the wingspan of the aircraft, but both dimensions, this is the 2D bin packing problem. And then a lot of our approximation guarantees go out the window but we have efficient heuristics for it. So uh, this also introduces the possibility for more variants of bin packing, such as variable size bin packing. All of a sudden we can reason about complexity, solutions, approximations to these relevant Air Force problems that we couldn't do before. And this is enabled by the simple use of mathematical models. So this topic is not about machine learning. It's not about deep learning. This is about mathematically grounded approaches, more along the lines of traditional AI. Now, where does the heterogeneity uh, come in? Where does the hierarchical nature of this topic come in? That comes in because, again, we want to reason about things like joint all domain command and control. What happens when you have multiple domains? You have inherent heterogeneity, right? Air effects are not as slow as land effects, but similarly, they're not as fast as cyber effects, right? There's a heterogeneity in the capability of the effects, the latency, et cetera. And that can be captured using mathematical abstractions. So that's the heterogeneous component of all of this. The hierarchical component comes within the domains themselves. For example, within the air domain, you have wings that are composed of groups, that are composed of squadrons, that are composed of units. Um, and so this has to be incorporated into the planning process. For example, at the group level, maybe we determine what the relevant targets are, then the wings determine how to assign which squadrons to which targets. And then at the unit level, you have your decentralized execution, for example. Um, all of this can also be captured via mathematical models and mathematical abstractions. Uh, so that is really the spirit of this topic is come up with some mathematical model and solution to relevant Air Force problems that captures both the heterogeneity and the hierarchical nature um, of multi-domain operations. I'll leave it at that. You might be muted. I can't hear you. I am muted. I am muted. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, all right. So we do have a couple questions. The first one are, what are your thoughts on applying transfer learning to adapt in various wireless communication environments where distribution of the channel parameters can be ephemeral and adaptation can be quite challenging? I, I don't know much about uh... You said wireless networks. I don't know much about communications. Um, 
Yeah, I hesitate to answer. I am knowledgeable in transfer learning, but I'm not sure how it would be applied to a communications problem. Perfect. Would, uh, let me see who asked the question. Avik, if you would like to expand on that, please feel free to do so. Uh, in the meantime, we'll move to the next question. Uh, how can you ensure that the, synth the synthetic environment properly represents properly represents the features that would be relevant in the real world domain? Right. Uh, there's there's a lot of uh, sort of manual labor that is involved in some of these things. So, for example, within the Air Force, uh, we we have the AFSIM environment that is used to simulate courses of action. And there are people that have tried to come up with lower fidelity versions of this. Uh, for example, uh, RAND uh, developed their AFGIM environment. And there's a lot of hand tuning where you have to determine what are the relevant features in advance. Of course, things like uh, uh, the radius of, of certain effects and how those uh, degrade over time or over distances and things like this. Um, but I, I'm not so much concerned with the fact with coming up with similar surrogate environments. I'm more concerned with given an environment that you think is similar, how do you derive similarity metrics to mathematically show uh, some evidence that it is similar enough to do transfer learning? So what, what does that mean? What does that look like? Uh, there's been some work in the literature, for example, in the areas of domain adaptation and manifold alignment where they try to do this, right? There, there's, a, there's a lower dimensional manifold that represents your data. And you can measure similarities between two manifolds. Uh, you can similarly measure similarity across a state space, right? There are things like state embeddings um, that will let you represent your states as lower dimensional vectors. And then of course, in a vector space, you have all kinds of uh, distance functions that you might use. Uh, some of them may be better suited to determine similarity of transfer uh, than others. Um, there's similarity over action space, there's similarity over transition dynamics, there's similarity over the reward signal or some representation thereof. Um, so really there are all kinds of neat ways that one might try to establish similarity um, for what you think is a similar surrogate environment. Perfect. The second part of that question is, would we be expected to deliver a simulation environment that accurately captures the phenomena, the phenomena of interest? That would certainly be within scope, but it's not required. You could, for example, take two existing, uh, perhaps seemingly disparate open AI gym environments and show that you derived uh, similarity metrics uh, that match up with transfer learning performance. Um, or just a transfer learning solution that performs very well. We're, we're, we're trying not to restrict uh, prospective performers in this way. If you do decide to come up with your own environment, sure. I mean, <laughs> the more environments we have, the, the merrier, we'll take it. Thank you. Next question. Uh, is, it, is it possible to get more information about which particular problems AFRL is interested in? Yeah, that's that's a tricky one. I myself am, am not an operational um, expert. Um, we could point you to operational experts, but there are some well-known ones. For example, suppression of enemy air defenses uh, is a very well-known uh, setting. Um, and so is the uh, joint fires where you have um, uh, multiple domains and, and, and trying to have a convergence of effects on the, on the adversary. So those are two very well-known ones. Um, I mentioned maximum on ground as well. Um, you can reach out to us uh, as, as part of this collaboration and we'll do our best to give you more relevant uh, uh, test scenarios. Next one. Have you looked at how to blend robustness and resilience with your mathematical models? As I haven't looked at it. I'm sorry, go ahead. Sorry, sorry. The second part of the question was, as data becomes more incomplete, inaccurate, or unavailable, how do the mathematical models adapt? That that's an interesting question. So I haven't looked at it myself. Um, I believe this is uh, with regard to the second topic that I mentioned, hierarchical heterogeneous planning, where I ask for mathematical models. Uh, to be honest, for that topic, I would steer away from machine learning. Machine learning uh, really muddies the waters when it comes to mathematically principled approaches. You know, we, we've seen in the literature, for example, what deep learning does to principled approaches such as uh, Monte Carlo tree search and Q learning you know, that traditionally have nice convergence guarantees, you bring in deep learning and yeah, you make these things empirically much more powerful, 
but then the guarantees go out the window. So for that topic, um, I would stay away from machine learning and I would just focus on purely mathematical principled um, approaches. And there are some old, the old era of machine learning had some of these, right? When you look at linear classifiers and things like that, that would be fine. Uh, but deep learning really muddies the water. So I'll stay away from that. I would look more, for example, operations research-based approaches, uh, combinatorial optimization-based approaches, uh, anything by which we can mathematically rigorously uh, reason about the problem. Thank you. Uh, so that actually, that got through all the questions we currently, Never mind. <laughs> we have one more question. Uh, in the second problem you discussed, you clearly want to adapt to the hierarchical structure of the Air Force or military. Would you elaborate more on commercial applications? Perhaps would the same structures apply to civil or corporate constructs? That is very interesting. I hadn't even considered that, but it makes a lot of sense because of course, I mean, within a company, you have an obvious hierarchy of authority, for example. Um, yeah, I, I would see any solution that would apply to, to this problem in particular to the hierarchical component should apply, I mean, all over the place. In a company, you have some high level objective that is essentially decomposed down the levels to, you know, the, the, the chiefs and supervisors and workers, and they all have different tasks that are all related to the same underlying high level objective. So at an abstract level, I would imagine that this is widely applicable, you know, in the private sector, public sector, all over the place, yeah. And, and again, that, that is the beauty of using mathematical abstractions, because this is with regard to the second topic uh, that the questioner is asking. Um, if you come up with the right mathematical abstraction, as I mentioned, you can even give it to an academic who has no idea what this is going to be used for. And that solution would apply to anything that can be modeled using that abstraction. So it might be a commercial application. It might, might be a military setting. Um, yeah, I'll leave it at that. Next question. What is the Air Force's current approach to solving hierarchical, hierarchical planning? And what is the average time to solution and accuracy of solution, if feasible? Have you considered mathematical optimization solvers? Boy, you are, you are really testing my memory. I know there's a paper, uh, there's an MIT paper on using uh, integer linear programming. Uh, very famous in combinatorial optimization and, and operations research to solve a, a bunch of different Air Force problems. I don't recall their run times, um, but we do have we do have an integer linear program that we've been using for the maximum on ground problem. And if I recall correctly, given 200 aircraft and about 20 airfields, it can solve that in the order of a few seconds. Uh, which sounds good, um, but integer linear programming is uh, an exponential time algorithm. So as soon as you start adding just a little bit more complexity to those numbers, the, it goes from seconds to minutes to hours, right? It's, it's, it's not very scalable. Um, but at any rate, 200 aircraft to 20 airfields, that might be good enough. Uh, some of these problems don't need to be incredibly scalable if, if the instances themselves are small. Um, I, I'd have to check on where else we have used, oh, where else has a uh, hierarchical planning been used? I know the Navy uses hierarchical task networks to decompose problems. Uh, there's some work done by uh, David Aha. Uh, he's a, he's a senior, um, senior level scientist at, uh, at the Naval Research Lab. He's done some work on that. Um, yeah, I don't recall where else we've used it. I know we've, we've used it in a couple other places, but I can't recall right now. Thank you for your question, Johnny. Uh, next question is from Edward. He asks, how was high performance computing been, sol been involved in solving such problems? Um, in solving both the problems of topic one and topic two? Uh, he said, I don't yeah, know. Yes. I don't know how it's been used. I know how it's been proposed to be used because this is um, this transfer learning conversation is one that I've had many times with many people. And the first thing that comes to mind is, well, parallelize it, right? 
Um, if we have a thousand computers, we can run a thousand simulations uh, at once and generate data three orders of magnitude faster. Um, and that's true, uh, but it, it, it again, it depends on the, the complexity of the problem and the complexity of the solution. So I'll give you an example. Um, the Alpha Star system that DeepMind developed to, to beat uh, uh, champion StarCraft II players, which is very impressive because StarCraft II is, you know, two multi-agent teams, real-time strategy, in incredibly, incredibly complex game. In fact, if you ask people, I think just five years ago, if we would be able to solve uh, StarCraft II, I think they would have said no. Um, now, it is a br very brittle system and it, it is exploitable, but it still managed to be uh, world champions. That took 60,000 years worth of real-time data. So I don't care how many machines you have, you can't, 60,000 is just intractable when each individual execution uh, of FSIM runs on the order of minutes and awesome runs on the order of hours. Um, you can still adopt some restricted version of that within a faster environment, which is what this, the, the ethos of that transfer learning topic is. Uh, but just applying it directly to AFSIM, I just, I just don't see how that could possibly work. It's just the, the order of magnitude is just too great to just parallelize it away. Uh, not only that, it, it required a million replays from the top 20% of humans. I mean, these are ridiculously um, data-hungry systems. So I don't think uh, high-performance computing by itself will be enough. I think it'll be a great complement to whatever the solution ultimately is, but by itself, it's, it won't be the solution. Thank you for that question. Uh, the next question has to do with just your contact information. I, I just want to point out and uh, correct me if I'm wrong, at the end of this section, we're gonna have a networking session that will be running for about 15 minutes. During this time, you'll be able to speak directly uh, with Dr. Velasquez and ask him questions uh, more directly. Looks like there was just a minor disconnection as well. Uh, he'll be rejoining in just a brief moment. All right, perfect. Back. Yeah, perfect. So I just wanna confirm with you after this session for, or after this Q and A session, there's gonna be 15 minutes of networking where you'll be available to, to talk to the participants. Mm -hmm. Sounds perfect. good. Awesome, so let's see if there's any other, any other current questions. So it looks, it's more of a comment, but it says you could comment on the use of this technology in counteracting the swarm of negative subsystems with system control. Swarm right. of negative subsystems? I, I don't know what this means. Yeah. Okay. Would you uh, mind uh, expanding on that, Vitaly? All right, we'll give that just, let's give a couple more, uh, a little bit more time for people to throw in any questions if they have them. If not, we could always uh, cut to that networking session now, but let's, uh, let's just give it a couple minutes. So would you be, so out of curiosity, would you be giving out your email or is that gonna be is there a funnel system? How does how does the communication? Oh, I, I can, should I just should I just put it in the chat? Yeah, I think that would be that'd be helpful. Thank you for that. Okay, it's in the chat now. And and again, for anybody who was late joining the session, I just want to make sure that you're familiar with every way to interact. Uh, on the right side of your screen, you'll see chat, questions, and attendees. If you click questions, you're able to simply type in a question and then I will read it live. Uh, you could type in chat your questions and I'll move them or, or ask them to whoever the presenter is during the time. And you could go to attendees and if you look up a specific attendee, you could privately message them as well. So just a few functions of the site. There's obviously a lot more, so feel free to explore. A question did just pop up um, for the transfer learning problem, is there a specific modality you want to focus on or would this be a generalizable transfer learning approach? Uh, there's no specific modality. Um, of course, when you when you stick to things like the visual modality, <clears throat> this enables uh, new kinds of different kinds of mechanisms with the use of convolutional neural networks. Uh, 
I know for, for, for sound waves, convolutional neural networks are also used pretty frequently. So depending on the modality, it affords different possibilities with text. I know uh, attention networks are all the rage now that that affords, I'm sure, some kind of different novelty to the transfer learning solution. Uh, so ultimately we're interested in, in, in the exciting tech that you can provide. We, we don't want to restrict the user to any one modality, but you should justify why you chose that modality. Thank you. All righty, so if there are no more questions, let's, uh, there is one more question. <laughs> Every time I say that, it seems to work. Yeah. All right. <laughs> awesome. So you mentioned three problems of interest to the Air Force. I wrote down suppression of enemy air defense, joint fires problem, and maximum on-ground problem. Do I have the correct names for each of these? Uh, yes. I, I would just add that maximum on-ground, um, there are two different problems. There's maximum on-ground parking, which is what I mentioned. And there's maximum on ground working, I think it's called, which is the actual taking into account the schedules of the processing times for each aircraft. Uh, those two aspects combined make a uh, maximum on ground. Uh, so ultimately, if you, if you decide to go with maximum on ground, you may want to tackle just one of the two. You may want to tackle both parts. Um, I don't know. I just wanted to make sure that distinction is clear. Thank you for expanding on that. Also, if people think it's easier to communicate verbally, um, if Dr. Velasquez is okay with it, feel free to use sure. the raise your hand function. Uh, you can see that on the bottom dashboard on your screen. Uh, you could just click that and I'll give you the ability to speak. I'll hand you the virtual microphone. So uh, yeah, but next question, will AFRL be providing the training data for the transfer learning problem for both yeah. the training and inference domains? No. Okay. All righty, so for the next 20 minutes, we're gonna be heading back to the lounge area. You'll see a few tables, about roughly 12 of them. They'll have a label on them indicating what the topic is for that specific table. Just give me a brief moment. I'll make sure all the tables are labeled appropriately. But take a seat at those tables, have an open conversation, and then we'll be meeting back for our next section on AI for MDO and video scene capturing at 1355 ET. So again- Can I be in, can, oh. I'm sorry to interrupt. Can I be at two tables at once? Because I have two, two topics. How does that work? Um, it's not possible, but I can change the topic that you, I'll let you know when I change the topic in the second half. Okay. Does that cool. work? All right, yeah, perfect. Thanks. So yeah, let's have you take a seat at table one. We'll make it easy so okay. people know where to find you. All right, perfect. I'm going to confirm what less, there's no more questions. Somebody asked just again, kind of, I think going back to a previous question, maybe the prior question concerned UAV swarming and teaming manned unmanned. Is there? Uh, I, I mean, UAV swarming is represented as a multi-agent reinforcement learning problem, for example would certainly be amenable to a transfer learning solution and would be within scope of this topic, if that is what the questioner meant. Okay, perfect. All right, everybody, so what's gonna happen now is you are all gonna be sent back to the lounge, take a seat uh, at a table. Uh, Dr. Velasquez will be found at table one if you wanna talk with him directly. So thanks everybody and we'll see you in the lounge. Um, I would like to invite Sarah Matat to the stage where she is going to be hosting a, a fireside chat on the topic of educational partnership agreements, EPAs. Sarah, uh, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. All right, perfect. So the floor is yours. Well, good afternoon and welcome everyone to the first fireside chat. I am Sarah Mita and I'm in the Office of Research and Technology Applications at the Information Directorate. I have with me today, Dr. Kashmir Abaraji, Dr. Peter Romine, both of the Navajo Technical University and Dr. Timothy Croker, the Enterprise Learning Officer for the Information Directorate. Navajo Technical University has an educational partnership agreement, also known as an EPA, 
with the information directorate. This is just one of our many types of agreements. The complete list can be found on the Innovari Partnerships website. An EPA is a formal agreement between a defense laboratory and an educational institution to transfer and or enhance technology applications and to provide technology assistance for all levels of education from pre-kindergarten and up. Navajo Technical University, NTU, is an accredited public tribal university with a number of degree paths in arts and sciences and a vision to provide an excellent educational experience in a supportive, culturally diverse environment, enabling all community members to grow intellectually, culturally, and economically. Without further ado, please welcome Drs. Abaraji, Dr. Romine, and Dr. Croker. So thank you all for joining us today, uh, Dr. Romine and Dr. Abaraji. Would you like to take a moment to introduce yourselves and your role at NTU? Uh, yeah, I'm uh, Dr. Peter Romine. I uh, head the electrical engineering program at Novo Tech. Uh, this is my seventh year. Uh, two of my uh, graduates uh, uh, are, are work there at Rome uh, for the Air Force Research Lab, uh, Erica Bagodi and Kirsch Davis. And, uh, and so, and so they're, I would say, a, a very uh, great success that, that we're really proud of and we're trying to replicate. And Dr. Abaraji? Yeah, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Yeah, my name is Kasmir Amaraji, Dean of Undergraduate Studies here at Navajo Technical University. Yeah, actually, this year is my 10th year at Navajo Technical University. Uh, we offer 60 programs in uh, both technical we are, and non technical programs. So we have 15 uh, baccalaureate degree programs, two master's programs. 23 certificate program and two associate degree programs. So, and then NT is also a beta accredited. We became a beta accredited since 2015, working on an addition of uh, more engineering programs, mechanical and environmental engineering coming up in the fall as well. So I'm very excited about this partnership. We finished our first 15 years, of the, uh, I mean, five years of the partnership. We entered another five year agreement this February. So this partnership is very useful to NTU. So it's a pipeline for our students getting the internship then from the internship, then they can get job placement. Like Dr. Romain said, we already have two of our electrical engineering graduates working at Rome, New York. Another thing I was wondering whether there is opportunity for uh, NTU faculty writing proposals and get research funded grants with the Air Force. That would be another plus for the university as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Croker, would you please introduce yourself and your role with the lab and how it applies to the Navajo Technical University? Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Can you hear me? Yes. All right, it worked today. Uh, my name is Tim Croker. I am the learning officer for the information directorate. And as such, I uh, do a lot of work in terms of outreach to historically black colleges and universities um, minority serving institutions and tribal colleges and over the last 10 years um, have brought interns from across the United States to the information directorate in Rome, New York. And I was uh, very lucky, got to be six or seven years ago, to meet uh, Dr. Romine and learn about Navajo Technical University. And uh, that's how we started to bring some interns to Rome from Navajo Tech. Very good, thank you. Uh, we'll start in with some questions. So uh, Dr. Romine and Dr. Abaraji, uh, I know you started to allude to some of the benefits, uh, but what benefits helped you to decide to enter an educational partnership agreement with the Information Directorate? Yeah, I would say the opportunities for the students uh, to, to be able and to be able to uh, uh, to, to do the internships, fellowships, uh, and then we also had faculty that, that were able to uh, to participate in that. And 
I guess what, like I said, like Dr. Roberts said, we'd like to be able to uh, grow that to, so that we can uh, build our capacity on campus to prepare students uh, for those skills. And so it was really in, uh, a very impressive uh, opening uh, discuss, uh, talk about you know, AI and, and all that. And, and we really love to be uh, teaching that here uh, at Navajo Tech uh, to all of our students because, you know, this, the, the one problem with the, the internships, fellowships, it only helps those that get to go, right? All the ones left behind get nothing. So, so that's the, the importance of, of having uh, a relationship where we, we're, we're uh, giving opportunities to, you know, to all of the students. And also, it might be useful too for when the faculty and the students do the research, if possible, they can get a white paper and have publication so that to increase the budget of knowledge by publication of their research work. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, so the next question is for Dr. Croker. Uh, the information directorate currently has two employees, as you mentioned um, earlier, and have and have had six interns from NTU. What benefits do you see for AFRL or the internship program by having an EPA with Navajo Technical University and bringing these individuals on board? So um, it, it is gonna be sort of the flip of what uh, Dr. Romain and Dr. Robert, Robert, Robert G, sorry, um, uh, mentioned. Essentially by having the interns come to Rome uh, we, we get a different uh, perspective on the work that we do, which has been very useful in terms of um, how it's crafted our research and some of our projects. Um, in addition, even for those interns that don't necessarily pursue a career with us, they wind up being lifelong friends of the lab and they do work that is related to the interests of the Air Force. Um, one of the things that we haven't mentioned is that we actually had um, a professor from uh, Navajo Tech come to the lab for two years and um, uh, pursued some research in the area of synthetic biology, which was um, eye-opening both for myself, because that's not necessarily my background, but um, it helped bridge the gap between um, two very disparate fields, which, uh, at least from my perspective, in terms of computer science and biology. And that's, that's kind of where we're learning um, the intersections of different disciplines by bringing such uh, different groups together. Very good, thank you. All right, I think we have time for one more question and starting with Dr. Romine, would each of you provide your perspective, feedback or advice for entities that may be considering an EPA with the Information Directorate? Um, yeah, I guess I, I think, you know, you need an official right platform, I think, to build a relationship, and so that's that to me is uh, it's sort of like you know any type of developing any type of relationship, you have to have a, some type of agreement, right, that, that gives you a platform, and, and I think this uh, this mechanism is is really good at that. Dr. Abaraji, do you have anything to add? You know, like uh, as I earlier said, yeah, the, it's good that we have this agreement, which we can renew every five years, and then that will enable our faculty and students to come to the summer fellowship, as well as also work from campus. If there's some work, they can also do from site, and also, as well as within the semester, because I find out that the summer is like too short. They will just go there for two weeks. They might not finish up the research, then they come back again. So if there is a way they can continue the project for more than a year or continue up to two years before the students graduate so that they can complete and publish a paper because it's difficult to do a research and publish within two months. Right, right, very good feedback. Okay, and Dr. Croker, do you have any feedback or advice for entities uh, that would like to consider an EPA? Absolutely, I would think about it as a, a long game um, it isn't a, a two two month connection to the lab. It's often a five, 10, 15 year connection to the lab. So 
some of my earliest interns from uh, Navajo Tech. I just reconnected to uh, this week with opportunities because I, I, I've remained in contact with them and they with me. And when I come across opportunities that are offered from the federal level to different universities, um, I make sure that they're aware of them. And there are many such instances uh, that that can uh, happen. So I encourage anybody that, that's considering it to pursue an EPA and think about how it will help them, not just the first year, but several years out. Very good. Thank you all for your feedback and thank you all for your time today. Uh, just a reminder, if you'd like to uh, look into the different agreements that we have to offer, again, look at the Inavari forward slash partnerships webpage and you can find additional information. Uh, at this time, I'll return it to Josh Kaplan. Awesome. Thank you very much, Sarah. And thank you uh, for everybody who participated in this fireside chat. Um, at this point, we're going to be moving on to the next section, which is going to be the challenge overview for AI for MDO and video scene capturing. At this point, I'm going to bring back uh, Dr. Uh, Velasquez to the stage. Give me one second to make sure I can get everybody back up here real quick. So, Dr. Velasquez, uh, Matthew uh, Cochon, Sean Fee. Sean Fee, and then the last uh, person on who's going to be uh, in the challenge area overview is going to be Tyler Witter. So with that, I will uh, once again uh, pass the torch to Dr. Velasquez. Thank you. So I'm actually presenting this topic on behalf of Jeffrey Hudek. Uh, with the, the last second could not make it, uh, but I am familiar with his work. He's a, he's a good colleague of mine. So the, the idea behind this topic is that uh, we want to apply AI to multi-domain operations. But uh, in particular, there are two things that we want to address when doing so. First off is the derivation of some kind of uh, trade-off analysis. So what I mean by that is, um, in military settings, for example, you might want to consider what would happen if I, say, assign an aircraft to some target, what is the probability that that will then jeopardize the safety of other aircraft? Or if I place a tanker somewhere, what is the probability that, you know, it'll hurt mission success? These kinds of trade-off analysis or analysis of alternatives, as, as it's sometimes called, um, is not easily captured <clears throat> by standard, uh, say, reinforcement learning and planning solutions, right? When you look at um, how the standard solutions get solved, they have some kind of reward signal associated with them uh, by which you can provide either positive or negative reinforcement um, in order to steer the agent uh, towards mission success and to generalize such behavior to other missions. Uh, that's what we see everywhere. That's what we see with um, the alpha series of papers, alpha go, alpha go zero, alpha zero, mu zero, alpha star, open AI five, you name it, right? Um, but it's not clear how you would adapt these state of the art technologies to be able to handle such trade-off analysis. So that's challenge number one, handling the, uh, being able to present a trade-off analysis to the user as to why an action is being taken uh, in a multi-domain adversarial real-time environment. That's the first challenge. The second challenge is, of course, uh, the data problem. Uh, for those of you that attended my uh, previous discussion on transfer learning for decision making, that was one approach that can be used to mitigate uh, sample complexity. Now, in this case, for this topic, you don't have to use transfer learning. You may come up with some entirely new form of reinforcement learning that is very sample efficient. So that's the second problem is data efficiency. And the third one is uh, the agent must have the capacity to explain its behavior to the human. And there are many ways that uh, this can be represented, you know, the first order logic over semantically meaningful features of the state space. Uh, there are ways to introduce state transition systems as an explanation, uh, causal networks. Uh, we're really not, not restricting the user in this way. Uh, finally, I'll conclude by saying uh, that as far as the platform to be leveraged for whatever is proposed, uh, Jeff mentioned that command modern operations is a very good tool. I'm not familiar with it. 
He says that would be a very good tool for this topic, uh, but that performers are welcome to propose um, their own environments. I'll conclude with that. Perfect. At this point, would uh, Tyler Witter, uh, would you like to say anything regarding the topic? Uh, I believe our topic lead, um, Sean Fee, had prepared an introduction. Um, oh, perfect. So I'll let him take away at the at the intro. Absolutely. Hi, uh, my name is Sean Fee. Um, Matt Cohan and Tyler Witter are uh, two of my colleagues that helped co-author this um, uh, topic we're working on, and it's the pursuit of a rapidly advancing capture. Um, in, in a nutshell, we're looking for a way to use, to, to leverage machine learning and deep learning to transcribe what's happening in a scene as it's happening near real time if possible. Um, so there's, there's plenty of military applications we can think of, but I had a couple of uh, commercial, you know, non-government applications. Um, you know, one could be for uh, traffic safety. You know, there's an accident um, somewhere in Manhattan and this captioner sees it happening real time, transcribes it and sends that to a uh, alert center, you know, a 911 call center. So before anybody can even call and report the accident, the NYPD already knows and it's gonna go, you know, take off. Um, some other ideas on using uh, machine learning and deep learning is potentially for a uh, captioning service for the visually impaired on live video. So this is a video that hasn't been uh, you know, prepped by anybody, but as a scene is playing out, the captioning occurs and then is spoken out uh, so you know, people can be helped uh, in that way. Um, so some of the challenges you know, I foresee is you know, computers are, are good at taking single images and captioning them, you know, and Tyler, you can speak to this, but we see it in, you know, Facebook, Google, um, they have all that nailed down. The problem with, with video is you're, you're sending in lots of different pieces of images all at the same time. How do you divide them up and how do you create context um, for, for what's actually happening? You know, and how does that context apply to, you know, somebody that may be interested in one aspect of, of the traffic scene versus another aspect of the traffic scene. You know, maybe you're you're a taxi driver. Um, so those are those are some of the things we're we're looking to solve, and, and these are the ideas that we uh, came up with to to you know incite some some thought and discussion uh, among the attendees. So uh, I'll turn it over to, to Matt or Tyler if uh, either of you would like to speak up from from the the AFRL or Air Force point of view. Yeah, sure. I'll I'll set the stage, and I think Tyler will be able to to go into a little bit, maybe more detail on the technical challenges associated with the learning aspects, probably of uh, of video and, and, and imagery captioning. But um, from a kind of a big picture perspective, so you know, one of the uh, the areas that that we use to describe the the work that we're doing in the kind of the intelligence business a little bit is processing and exploitation. So. It comes down to how can we uh, we get more situation awareness of a uh, of an area, and you know certainly a challenge with all of the with the big data problem that we have with all that the data that our that our exquisite sensors are collecting, and then and then also as we try and tap more and more into uh, PAI into publicly available information, um, can we have means to be able to triage that right into into um, candidate uh, uh, information blobs that we think are um, that are worth having analysts look at or or for further processing and exploitation in an, in an automated fashion ones that if we have time um, we it may be worth looking into and then and then ones that don't seem like they're of uh, they're of interest um say it you know it's getting um, you know, maybe due to maybe cloud cover, or it's it's all sand, or or whatever, right? Um, so so that so what we we want this kind of captioning technology for is to be able to do this kind of smart indexing, 
so that we can bounce that against uh, profiles of interest and subscriptions and such that analysts have, and they can be cued to um, to that. So, so the challenges, of course, is you're you're blending the world of 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 um, imagery and, and video scene interpretation along with uh, with natural language generation and and techniques and being able to describe what you see, and um, and there's all sorts of challenges associated with with training algorithms, you know, uh, different different machine learning approaches to um, to getting better and better at that, you know, in a supervised, unsupervised, reinforcement learning kind of way. So, um, so we think that this is this is a great opportunity for some partnership between the work that we're doing for the Air Force and um, and academia and and industry with commercial applications. And I'll turn it over to Tyler. Uh, thank you, Matt. I think that uh, you did a good job setting the stage there and hitting on a number of items I think will come up in discussion um, amongst attendees. So a little about me. Um, I've been a in-house researcher and developer here at the lab for the better half of about four years now. And, um, you know, coming from the Air Force perspective, one of the big things we do is applying it to Air Force problems, right, which is which has come across in so far what Sean and, uh, and Matt have, have mentioned so far. And uh, it's a lot to be said for machine learning and AI, right? It's, we can go on for hours and hours, and a lot to be said in terms of applying what is state of the art, what is cutting edge, what is successful in academia and, uh, and commercial, and then applying to the Air Force domain, right? And then from a machine learning perspective, uh, data is king, right? And um, you know, while we have lots of data from Air Force perspectives, it's not always an easy environment to work in. It's not always an easy environment to apply some of these cutting edge academic and commercial algorithms, right? So it's uh, it creates for a more challenging environment doing research and development here from the Air Force side, right? In terms of, you know, um, what can we grab off the shelf and uh, what can we apply from all these open source data sets, right? In terms of all the computer vision tasks, which have gained you know, huge popularity in recent years, and how do we apply them to the Air Force domain, which looks at the world through a slightly different lens. So a lot of difficulties and challenges in terms of applying supervised learning, unsupervised learning, you know, reinforcement learning, and the likes. Um, so it's a, it's an exciting field for me personally to be working in, in this. And uh, video captioning is just you know was one one facet of this AI puzzle that we are definitely interested in and uh, pursuing from an Air Force perspective. Yeah. All right, thanks, uh, Tyler and Matt, for, for summing that up so succinctly. Um, gave uh, much more deeper technical uh, thoughts than I did uh, with my intro. So thank you for that. And I think at this point, um, we can turn it over for uh, questions. Um, if anybody uh, wants to send them in on the chat, uh, to any four of us, we'll, we'll do our best to, uh, to field them. Perfect. Thank you very much. So again, uh, we're just gonna go over how to ask questions, what the best best way to do so is. On the right side of your screen, you'll see a little questions icon, little bubble with a question mark in it. Go ahead and click that. And then if you have a question, feel free to type it in there or just type it in the chat. Um, we do have one question currently, but just wanna make sure that uh, everybody's aware of these functions. So. This one is for uh, Dr. Velasquez. Uh, so one way to do trade-off analysis is to assess the current state versus the proposed state and return the difference as a tactical effectiveness metric. Is that in the direction of what you're looking for or is that a bit of a cop-out? Um, if I'm understanding you correctly, that's that's uh, perfectly suited for this topic and I'll, I'll give you one example. Um, you, may have, you may be familiar with the Mu Zero architecture. Uh, the latest of the alpha, alpha, go, alpha, zero. Uh, that one learns a model of the environment and then predicts what future states will look like. Um, so if you can do that, for example, by, by taking an action, seeing what the state is and predicting what a future state might look like and attaching semantically meaningful interpretations for both the observed and the predicted state, then you could do a trade-off analysis, absolutely. Next question. Uh, for real-time video captioning, to what level of details, to what level of details it would expect? For example, telling everyone is doing what or telling the overall what the scene is about, what evaluation criteria will be applied to this? 
I think a lot of that um, starts off with like what the question was asking. You have to pick your scene that you're, you're looking for and then make sure you have tons of trained data to allow your, your model to work off of. Um, the, the level of uh, accuracy we're looking for is, is um, I'm going to have to defer to Tyler and Matt on that, on the best way to score that. But it all, uh, it all starts with the perspective of the uh, scene you know, in the context of the scene. Take my best shot at that answer. Um, you know, what are we looking for? Uh, a lot of that is situational dependent, right? And a lot of what we can currently do with machine learning is very focused, right? So if we can curate a data set for a specific activity of interest, right, we can train a machine learning model with fairly robust accuracies, right? As soon as we try to train models to, you know, recognize multiple different activities, right? Maybe across multiple different scenes, across multiple different areas of interest. Right. Suddenly, as the ontology grows, as does the difficulty of the machine learning training. Right. So um, what are we looking for specifically? It really could be anything. Um, it could be starting from you know, a walk before you can run scenario. Right. Uh, what are the individuals doing at a high level? Right. Um, what are the individuals doing? across the scene from an hour ago to what they are doing now and can we make any assumptions building on previous contextual evidence what they're actually up to right so from a naive perspective we can just simply caption individual moments of time right but then from a more interesting more applicable what happened over the course of a 10-hour fmv clip a right, full motion video clip it would definitely be you know, of interest to an analyst per se to be able to get some some situational awareness on what happened across an entire FMV clip versus what happens at a single moment in time or what happened in a single moment in time across 10 different hours, right? So there's definitely complexity there um, where really we, we need to, to walk before we can run. And once we tease that out, then we can start advancing towards more complex capabilities. And, and, and maybe to, uh, this is Matt, maybe to expand on that um, also a little bit from a functional perspective, you know, you could could look at the decomposing a scene, whether whether it's an image, a still image or, or a video, say into, you know, identifying what the objects are. And a lot of the, the computer vision uh, work that we're doing and others are doing are, are focused in on, on how we can do that object detection, right? So, so Sean works on a on a program that we're um, that we're doing with the Joint AI AI Center, um, that is a you know a tool to be able to accelerate that um, that supervised learning of, of of doing bounding boxes in a really efficient way, and, and being able to um, to help train the the, um, the machine learning algorithm into what class of of, of object that is, um, but then also maybe what human actors. Um, are, are in that scene and then what activities are happening, right? Those are different, you know, part, you know, semantically different things and, and uh, part of the ontology. And then think about something that's that's perhaps more, more sophisticated. And we were talking about this earlier, say something as simple as, as, a, uh, as somebody in a, in a video scene, maybe watching a, a, a camera where you're worried about terrorist activity or something, um, places a, um, a satchel or something down and it's there for a while and and then a different person picks that up. So for a um, for a, a scene captioner, maybe you might be able to recognize that the, that the person that placed it there is different from the person that um, that retrieved it. That might flag something. That might set off a, an alert where we want to we want to index that in such a way, where a uh, where a, a profiler can catch that up, uh, can pick that up, and say, "Hey, we want to we want to send this as a as you know a possible nefarious activities going on here." So, over. I'm just going to quickly add just one more point, just uh, on top of what Matt just said. One thing I'd say we're very good at today, machine learning wise, and across you know Air Force and DoD, is we're very good at detecting objects. We're very good at tracking objects. You know, we're very good at doing things at the object level, right? But as soon as you try to incorporate contextual information, that is, all, that is, that is really where we're, we're looking to get to, right? That was really provide us with those next 
next gen capabilities, right, where we can start capturing the fact that the satchel was placed by one person was picked up by another, but we can't do that without the ability to extract contextual information, right? So doing more than just the person dropped a bag, right? But this person had these features, right? This person uh, dropped it off at this time in this location, and there was a different person who showed up with different features in the first person, but we can, we don't know that unless we capture that contextual information. So that's really definitely uh, a big departure point or uh, where we're looking to get to versus where we are currently. And one of the, one of the examples to kind of play on that, I, I brought up um, in Manhattan, I lived there for 12 years, took the subway a ton of times. And, you know, whenever you're down there, you hear, if you, if you see something, say something. Um, so there's, there's a human aspect, but there's also thousands of cameras uh, monitoring the subway system. There's obviously not a thousand people watching those cameras, but if, if we have a, a model, and this goes back to the, you know, the metrics and the accuracy, a model that is built up on tons of um, real subway data that can, that can detect. I know when a, when a platform is empty, I know that a bench is there and a bench is supposed to stay still. I know a garbage can is supposed to stay still, but what is this other object? You know, is that object a person that's that's having trouble or in distress? Is that is that object a uh, a bag? You know, something nefarious that shouldn't be there. Over time, as you build up that body of data, and your model gets better and better after training, your your metrics are going to get tighter. Your accuracies are going to go up, and, and that's just something like uh, Tyler's saying. We're, we're at the walk phase right now. Um, running would be that, and, and something that that could alert. Uh, authorities, you know, NYPD, MTA of a, you know, something, something wrong happen, happening. And the alert level should be, you know, it should be 95% accurate, you know, because you don't want people running off for things that aren't really happening to check them out. Um, so again, to, to answer the original question, that the, the accuracy and the, uh, the metrics are going to be very uh, forgiving and they, they would be expected to build up over time. Thank you very much uh, for those responses. Uh, the next question, apologize. The the next question is more of a statement, but well, uh, <laughs> it'll be more of a conversation. But how is one going to filter the scene generation markup, not to create a mass spoofing or flooding of networks, bringing down public service reporting or a downstream response akin the to Colonial Pipeline hack, akin to the Colonial Pipeline hack. Yeah, that's that's something we're we're looking at to uh, industry and academia uh, and the commercial sector to help us solve. Um, you know, these are that's why this is a challenge problem. We got to figure out. You're right. If somebody knows that this capability exists and there's playing with a system, how does the system know what's real and what's not? Um, so I, I think uh, I don't know if Matt or Tyler, you can speak to the uh, the trust in AI and the ability to uh, make sure your AI isn't being hacked or played with. Um, so you guys have any, any comments? I guess I'll start, you know, and, and say with anything, any cool capability, any machine learning AI, there's really two hats that you wear, right? It's either you're a white hat or you're a black hat, right? In other words, you're looking to do good with technology or you're looking to do evil with it, right? And you know, that's where adversarial really comes into play. Um, and Obviously with cybersecurity and trust and all those things, all technology has its more vulnerable points, right? Software in general is vulnerable, right? It has bugs, it has issues. That's why we were constantly updating. And uh, in this specific scenario, I'm not familiar with the uh, Colonial Pipeline hacks, so I apologize. So I can't reference that specifically, but in terms of filtering scene generation markup, it's a difficult challenge. Um, like I said, mostly to start from ground zero, we focus on a specific scenario. Right, and we uh, we can provide ground truth from a, from a supervised learning perspective to say this is exactly what we're looking for in a machine learning model, and we can do some adversarial alongside of that to say, hey, we can break the model pretty easily, right, by inserting fake elements into the scene, by changing the features just slightly enough so it spoofs and, and fools the model, right? I mean, th these are definitely very popular. Uh, approaches to training as well as to fooling and 12 is making machine learning models more robust right so that's definitely one way to do it um matt any thoughts no i i mean i think 
you guys hit on the right thing. I mean, we, 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 I think a key challenge with this is, is kind of scoping what we're looking at. So it, it really is um, trying to come up with a context to where um, smart indexer for the types of modalities that we're talking about. So, and, and is looking at still images versus video, is that a crawl to a walk? Um, I could I could see where maybe it's a little easier actually in some cases to to generate context awareness in a video than it is in a uh, than um, from one image to another. So so you could argue that that it's not like uh, video captioning is necessarily harder and more sophisticated than imagery. It could be a flip flop at times. Um, but I think what we're trying so you know how it would apply to I, I don't. It's hard to say with the colonial pipeline hack and certainly the, the big deal that's created with fuel prices and all that, you know, how would you be able to, um, to and, you know, and we're, we also have to look at things from a kinetic and non-kinetic perspective too. So so how are, how can we describe things that you're not necessarily even just watching on, on video, but you're describing an activity that's happening, um, say, in, in, in cyber, and, and then being able to to alert somebody to this this you know um, unfolding um, um, scenario. So, um, but again, it come it really does come back to this contextually aware smart indexing. I think is the um, it's the is is what we're kind of grappling with and, and want some help with in partnerships. Over. Perfect, thank you uh, for responding to that. Uh, it looks like we're gonna have time for about one more, one more comment. Um, this is regarding for speeding up bounding boxes, performing attention cropping based on activations works well. Standard bounding box object detection, YOLO slash SSD slash et cetera, has to calculate dozens to hundreds of candidate boxes that impose a cost. So Sean, you could probably talk to this a little bit just based on what you guys are doing with with Fuel AI and and, and with the Jake and all of that, right? And and the, the I think the novelty of what we did there was using a tracker to be able to to help track the you know the object that we want to continually um, you know and, and, and incrementally kind of um, kind of label as it's as it's moving moving through a scene and and maintaining that bounding box. Um, if you want, I don't know if you want to talk to that. Yeah, this, yeah, this example is you can take like a, let's say it's a 15 second clip and pause it in at zero seconds, five, 10, 15 seconds, and you're following a, a truck. A user or me, you know, a labeler, a labeler would label that truck four different times. And then this, this tool learns, it learns where the object is, learns how it moves and interpolates everything in between. So you play the, the clip back and then you've got your uh, your bound um, truck moving across the screen. And that gets fed back in to help obviously train your model better um, based on the, the type of object you're interested in. Um, and that's kind of one of the things that we wanted to highlight here in this in this uh, AMA is that it's, it's a government owned tool and it can be leveraged to help, you know, academia and industry. Uh, to work on these types of problems, you know, and we have the expertise here in house, as you can tell, uh, to help with to help develop or, or get uh, anybody on the AMA past some stumbling blocks uh, that they may have, or at least try to help uh, get past them. Um, so yeah, glad uh, glad glad you brought that up, Matt, because that's that's a big point is is the the expertise and the. Uh, professionalism we have here is is going to welcome you with open. just a, a quick comment um i'm going to agree because i feel like i read this more as a statement than you know as a as more than a question um and we as, as i just mentioned we we have tools here that are really pushing the envelope in terms of data labeling which is accelerating our machine learning processes right and we've gotten really good at doing labeling, doing object detections, and you know, drawing bounty boxes. We've gotten very good at that, you know. And uh, video captioning 
is a nice next step segue in machine learning is that what do we do next now that we are very good at detecting objects of interest, right? What's, what's the next level of intricacy that we can reach, you know, given these capabilities? So attention cropping, right, and other, you know, um, activation type methodologies to detect objects of interest and tag them is definitely something that we are capable of now and do a very good job at, right? And it's really taking that next step, you know, towards you know, building sentences, um, thinking about uh, imagery and summarizing and describing it the way humans do is really that next big step that we're, we're jumping towards. I have a question actually for um, sort of piggybacking off of that statement. Uh, would it be of interest under your topic to use uh, what is known as weakly supervised uh, localization or captioning where you don't have bounding boxes at all? You have your standard labels, right? Is there a face? Is there not a face? And then, for example, in the area of class activation maps, which I think is what the questioner is getting at with regard to activation, um, in class activation maps, you simply look at the activation and you can upsample it through the pooling layers to see exactly what the bounding boxes should have been without ever requiring them. And that can be used for captioning. Uh, because I would imagine, I'm not an expert in this area, but for our military settings, I imagine we don't have an abundant supply of bounding boxes but we might have standard labels that we can leverage for weekly supervised captioning. Uh, I would say that's definitely of interest. I mean, um, I don't have any experience in that personally, um, but any, any form of, uh, can we get around the cost of data labeling, right? And still achieve our end goal, right? Whether it's weekly um, supervised learning, whether it's self-supervised learning, you know, jumping on the fact that we can, uh, take advantages from NLP and computer vision and how we can train language models and train visual language models, right? And use different angles at attacking this, at this problem, it's definitely of interest. So yeah, that's, that's definitely one approach that is, I would say being pursued by, I don't know POC offhand personally who is, but I would, I would, uh, would say it is. It's a good question. Awesome, so that brings us to the end of the, uh, the Q&A uh, session. Good afternoon. I'm Steve Colenzo with the Air Force Research Lab Information Directorate, part of the Technology Transfer Office that we call the Office of Research and Technology Applications. What we're trying to shape a picture of here today at the Innovari Aspire event, this AMA, is we're trying to identify the types of tech transfer opportunities or agreements, one being an EPA that we referenced earlier, and now one being a cooperative research and development agreement. And we're exposing challenges to the public, to you attendees, to give you an idea of what we're looking for in terms of relationship that's both collaborative and engaging in a two-way street. And I know that collaborative is usually that, uh, that two-way street, but we really wanna reinforce that technology transfer is the, the, how we share information with the public, as well as how the public shares information with us. So CRADA, Cooperative Research and Development Agreement, is a really beneficial agreement that we use as the DOD to work with industry, state and local governments, academia, as well as other non-traditional uh, participants of which we wouldn't work with normally. Today, I have with, with this session, we have uh, Dr. Preble from the Research Institute of Technology, Rochester Institute of Technology, as well as Dr. Fanto from the Air Force Research Lab Information Directorate. Now we, as, as the information directorate, have a CRADA with, our, with the Re Rochester Institute of Technology, and we're going to talk about how it's been beneficial to both parties and really uh, expose the opportunity that's available for the government to work with industry. Quick, few quick things. A CRADA is not a procurement or grant, so there's no money exchange. It allows for a lot of flexibility for us to work with partners that we wouldn't normally be able to via a regular contract, but it also allows us to take the consideration of the private industry when we're doing some of our work. So we can share facilities, we can share information, and we can share equipment, while all the while enhancing whoever our collaborator is on the other side. So now I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Preble and Dr. Fanto for some introductions. Over to you. Uh, Stefan, you go first. Okay, sure. Hi, everyone. 
Thanks for attending. My name is Stefan Preble. I'm a professor here at Rochester Institute of uh, Technology. I'm here in my office uh, today, and it's a nice and sunny day, not snowing uh, like it usually is in even May. <laughs> so I've been at RIT since uh, 2007. Uh, my background is in integrated photonics, and that is what we are working very closely uh, with uh, Air Force Research uh, Lab on. Uh, you can see some wafers in the background over here, and actually uh, the one that is uh, in that wooden frame uh, was made as part of our CRADA uh, with uh, Air Force. So our goal uh, working with Air Force is to uh, use uh, the same manufacturing technology that's used to make all of the chips that uh, we use in our world, but applying it to the new emerging application of uh, quantum information science. So quantum computing, quantum communication, uh, sensing, and so on. So this CRADA that uh, we've had for, I think, uh, seven years, and we just re uh, renewed it uh, again uh, for another five years, really has been key to enabling uh, this technology. Mike. Thanks, Stefan. So I I'm Mike Fanto. I'm a senior research physicist with the uh, US Air Force. I've been with the US Air Force for 20 years. Uh, this actually, this month actually marks my 20th year. Um, my, I'm a trained physicist and uh, my PhD is actually in, in, in integrated photonics. Uh, I've worked on stuff from bulk optics to fiber to integrated photonics, laser systems, uh, nonlinear optics, and quantum. So right now I am the experimental lead for the quantum information processing group specifically the photon-based qubit group. And that's where our tie with uh, Rochester Institute of Technology comes in. We're making high dimensional and highly entangled qubit systems for uh, photon-based qubit systems on phase stable platforms. And to do that, you really do need integrative photonics. So the expertise of Stefan and his group at RIT mates very well with the expertise of our group and uh, hence the CRADA was born. The other nice thing about the CRADA is it's allowed both teams to uh, patent together and a CRADA covers those IP relationships very, very well. And uh, I'll turn it back over to Steve. Dr. Preble, Dr. Fanto, thanks so much. You kind of already hinted in, into uh, towards the answers of, what, of the questions that I was gonna ask you. But Dr. Preble, if you would like to add anything on the journey that you've had and maybe some benefits or considerations that spun out of having a CRADA with the Information Directorate and the work you're doing with uh, Dr. Fanto and his team. Yeah, uh, happy to. So uh, collaboration is really key to mo moving uh, these uh, really complicated technologies forward. And this uh, CRADA has made that collaboration uh, really seamless. Uh, between our uh, two institutions and actually uh, partner institutions that also have CRADAs uh, with Air Force underneath uh, the same general uh, quantum integrated photonics umbrella. But really, I, I, I can identify uh, four particular uh, things that uh, really uh, have been a benefit. Uh, first is uh, obviously the people. Uh, we work very closely uh, with uh, Dr. Fanto and uh, his team uh, that he leads. It's, uh, he's the experimental lead uh, of a, a group of scientists uh, at AFRL. And uh, that means that uh, our team is bigger than just what I have here at RIT, right? Uh, they assist us on every uh, level from uh, theoretical all the way to uh, testing. And uh, we're moving more and more towards uh, deploying uh, these uh, technologies. So really being able to uh, uh, work uh, closely with this team just basically uh, more minds are better than a uh, uh, few. Then the other uh, that uh, uh, Steve uh, mentioned earlier were uh, fi the facilities and equipment. AFRL uh, has amazing facilities, uh, amazing pieces of equipment that we just don't have available to us here uh, at RIT. So that uh, the CRADA allows us to really uh, use these for uh, these experiments uh, in order to uh, move this uh, technology uh, forward. Another area is uh, workforce uh, development. So I'm at a university, right? So I teach uh, students uh, and the CRADA enables a uh, really uh, straightforward exchange of our students to work in the labs uh, at AFRL. 
Uh, we commonly have uh, students go there in the summer, but actually RIT is really well known for its uh, co-op program. In order to get a uh, degree in engineering here, you actually have to go to school for five years, uh, one of those years being uh, for co-ops. And many of uh, my own students and students that I know uh, that work with other professors here have gone to the AFRL labs and gotten really valuable uh, research and engineering experience. And uh, some of them end up uh, going back to AFRL uh, for, for their uh, careers. So uh, being able to uh, send our students out there and benefit from the great people and the uh, facilities uh, is really invaluable. And then uh, Mike, uh, uh, hit on this uh, last point, uh, but I'll just reiterate it, uh, intellectual uh, property. Uh, the CRADA, it has all the terms uh, necessary uh, for us to uh, develop uh, joint IP. And uh, the uh, agreement gives uh, RIT a first right to, uh, to go out and do that. But if, if we choose not to, uh, we're still able to be included uh, if, if the government chooses to, to go forward. So really uh, being able to just make it very straightforward for us to come up with new inventions we have uh, several times, that is really key. So we have been working together basically 10 years now and uh, going from a really initial demonstration of the technology, now we're doing, uh, like I said, uh, that wafer back there and we're, we're doing more. Uh, so all of these things are uh, created uh, by the CRADA. That's great. Thank you so much for all that information. And you kind of hit down, you ran down the list, you're, you're maximizing the creative to its full potential and all the things that is allowed under it and working and collaborating with the government. Dr. Fanta, would you like to add anything to that? Yeah, I, I would just add to uh, some of what Stefan said as well. The fact that uh, we do have resources that uh, not, sometimes universities just don't have access to. Um, one of them being uh, actually the, the wafer that Stefan um, uh, well, pointed to behind him. Um, so this was done out of one of the OSD funded manufacturing technology centers, uh, AIM Photonics, which is about two hours east of uh, Rome, four hours east of Rochester in uh, Albany, New York. And these are very expensive wafer runs, but a crater because IP is covered, collaborations covered. It's something the government can bring to the table and bring all its partners on. So under this CRADA, which we have with RIT, we have similar EPAs and CRADAs with other universities. And it allows us to take this knowledge base that is not living solely in one group, but now becomes a full environment for developing, in this case, quantum technologies in a scalable, and feasible environment being uh, integrated photonics that just one entity could not either use all the space for or uh, pretty much afford. Um, these, as I said, these are expensive, but we can capitalize on this agreement and create a better benefit for the DOD, the universities, and in, in, as it is this technology, the quantum environment of the US in general. I'll turn it back over to you, Steve. Perfect. Dr. Fanto, thanks so much for that. All great points. Good addition to what Dr. Preble said. And it, it's almost the, the other question I had for the two of you was about providing perspective and feedback, um, which you already did. So if you wouldn't mind, how about providing a little, a little bit of advice for, for maybe a, a partner that hasn't been in, in, in entered into one of these agreements with us or uh, how we would actually go about this? Like, it was it for, was the process hard? Was it too formal? Things of that nature. Dr. Preble, I'd like to start with you, and then you can kick it to Dr. Fanta, and then I'll roll out with some closing remarks. Over. Okay. Yeah, so my key piece of advice would be to seek out the, the people to uh, establish a relationship. Um, identify the technical people like Dr. Fanto uh, that uh, align uh, with what you are doing uh, within your organization. And the academic side, a really nice program that uh, Air Force has is their summer faculty program. That, that's really where my relationship with uh, AFRL started. I applied uh, 10 plus years ago and uh, I was able to get uh, one of those and I worked within those labs for that summer and just the relationship evolved. Uh, where we wanted to continue that relationship uh, uh, really uh, uh, continuously and the CRADA was uh, key to doing that. So look for uh, those initial opportunities to work with the technical folks. 
I, I would also add to that, it, it allowed uh, uh, Dr. Preble to do a sabbatical with us as well um, and, and work with us day to day in the lab, yep. which I, I think was great. Uh, also on the summer faculty side, there's also all the other programs for students. And sometimes the, uh, the entity that goes back and forth is not necessarily the professor, but it is the student. So we have all of our uh, GI and everything else, uh, summer student programs that I think should be capitalized on right off the bat. And as uh, Dr. Preble hit on too, the um, co-op programs, those two vehicles, uh, should get the foot in the door for what is uh, the technical areas that are overlapping. From there, if it is feasible, build the CRADA, build the EPA, and then it just, the natural ones balloon from there in the amount of uh, interaction that, that happens. Back to you, Steve. Awesome. Dr. Fantel, Dr. Preble, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for being candid. Of course, we don't always have uh, such fruitful engagements. We usually have a lot of, lot of different things happening under our roof. And every now and again, you'll have an outlier or two, but the majority of our agreements are really, really well-rounded and you can get a lot done with them. And it allows us to push the needle of both innovation and discovery. And that's what we're really trying to do with the Innovari Aspire series, is we're trying to engage non-traditional and or traditional, both academia, industry, and I'll let, let everyone know that we want to work with you. And there's ways that we can do it that are not just traditional versus, and they're not tied up in a lot of government lingo. So I hope this was beneficial. Again, thank you to Dr. Preble, Dr. Fanto. And with that, I'll send it back. You're welcome. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you very much. Um, so moving forward with uh, with the agenda, the next person I would like to invite to the stage is Dr. Sarah uh, Usio to discuss the next topic, which is uh, validation of algorithms. So again, thank you for everyone who participated in the last keynote session. And uh, the floor is yours, Sarah. Wonderful. Thank you very much. I'm very excited to be here and talking to everybody today. And I'm going to talk to you about the problem, challenge problem, uh, software assurance uh, for untrusted data. So let me set the stage a little bit first for you. Uh, when we're talking about our missions and what's going on, I'm not so much interested in cybersecurity. I'm interested in making sure that mission gets accomplished. Now, here's a few factors that go into every mission that gets put together. And it's, it's not just uh, unique to the government. It's unique to, it's not unique is the problem. One of the things we have is that we didn't write the software for the most part that we're using to run our missions. We don't own the hardware. Usually we're renting space, probably in a cloud somewhere from Amazon or Google or Microsoft. And thirdly, we don't know who our neighbors are in cyberspace. Who's living there close by us? Uh, what's the, the reach into our data? that our mission relies on. With all those factors together, it makes you wonder and scratch your head that we managed to get any missions accomplished. So what we wanted to do is take a step back with this challenge and say, what do we need to do to make sure our data is what we think it is, gets to where it needs to go, and is available when we need it? So with all of those things put together, we know there are lots of different approaches out there as well as ones we haven't even thought of yet. Uh, the purpose of this challenge is to bring those aspects together, the we didn't write the software, we don't own the hardware, and we don't know who our neighbors are, bring them together and say, what can we still do to assure our data? Uh, we would like to partner with you out there. So academy, academia, industry, other government partners, whoever we need to bring to the table to work on this problem, let's put our brains together and see what we can do to solve it. Uh, when we're talking about this data, uh, there's a few things I'd like to, to clarify. Uh, mission assurance is thrown around an awful lot in different papers and different venues. I uh, wanted to bring us back to what are we talking about with mission assurance? And I will tell you, it is not cybersecurity. It is back to the definition of I want to get a particular job done. I want to get it done in a certain amount of time and I want to have X results. 
If you can guarantee those things, then that is mission assurance provided. Uh, within the information life cycle, which is where we deal with a lot of the data and transmission is one aspect of it. We wanna bring you back to what are the different phases of the information life cycle. So for that, we start with data generation. Are there sensors creating this data? What, what is happening uh, that creates this data? So generation, and then there is a processing of the data that may or may not happen. Uh, there's transmission of the data that as it goes through the system, there's potentially storage of the data during its life, um, which may or may not happen. And then there is consumption of the data. So it, at some point it, it goes from generation to being consumed by some end user. Uh, the sixth and final uh, area of the life cycle is actually the destruction of it. And as anyone who is uh, familiar with cyber knows, it's very hard to find out that uh, do things actually go away once, once you've consumed that data? Did it actually disappear or is it still living somewhere in bits or bytes? Um, so within that entire information life cycle, there is careers worth of work that we could be doing. Uh, this particular challenge is focusing us on uh, the transmission section of the data as well as potentially the generation. Where do we need to uh, tackle the data to actually make sure we can validate it and provide that assurance that it is what we want it to be and it gets where it needs to go. So with those different touch points, we are looking in this challenge to take those, either do an analysis of existing methods, come up with our own methods, and then have somebody else do a third party analysis because I, I don't know about you guys, but every time I, I do a, a problem, if I check my own work, I get the right answer. But sometimes if somebody else double checks my work, they see where I missed a, a plus or a minus sign. So you always wanna have a third party verify that what you think you have, you have. Um, <laughs> I, love the, I love the emojis. Uh, I might not have mentioned it, but I'm a mathematician. So that, that resonates quite a bit with me, uh, any math examples. Uh, so when we when we go through this, we want to have these methodologies uh, look at them. We have data sets we can use for examples. Um, there are always more data sets out there. And we also don't expect any solution we come up with to be the end all be all data set solution. Um, there are different data sets that are special and unique that might have different characteristics that we can either take advantage of in doing this uh, validation and verification or they might be challenges to doing this for the data and providing that assurance. So let's see which ones we can find uh, that are appropriate for data sets that we have and be able to uh, clearly delineate what we are able to do with the data, what assurances we can provide, what is the risk with that data, and what are the boundary conditions in which that'll work? Under what circumstances can we provide assurances with the data with this technique or, or algorithm um, and allow those to be in use then. Um, so we're looking for partners to, to tackle this challenge with us and uh, looking forward. Uh, in the last talk, it was great to hear all of the different uh, opportunities we have for partnering and working with folks that we can tackle these problems together and work on them. Um, with that, I, I guess I would ask, uh, are there folks that start to have questions want to learn more about these awesome thank you very much sarah for the uh for that uh, introduction there and again yeah at this point we'll open the floor to any questions that anybody may have uh again you can use on the right side of your screen you'll see uh the chat and the questions icon you could just click those and type any questions that you may have into into one of those sections we'll make sure that uh sarah hears them and we get those answered give everyone just a brief moment to uh, type any questions if they have any. Perfect, we have one question. Um, are formal methods of interest to in verifying implementations of AI and ML algorithms? Absolutely. Uh, great question to ask a mathematician. Of course, I'm going to say yes to formal methods. Um, I would love to do that. Uh, some of the formal methods and the higher order logic theorem provers uh, that we've worked with before, I think they are great steps in doing this. Uh, 
One of the things we've also found in, in our initial forays in, into this type of challenge is that uh, these processes tend to be very manual and uh, very man hour expensive. So what can we do to not only find the right algorithm or the right formal method and what can we do to speed things up? Um, or is what we're going to come out of this that the only ones that we can do this uh, assurance on our data and the validation of it is for only our really, really important and highly critical information that we need to send across. But yes to formal methods. Um, I didn't see who asked the question, but I like you already. Thank you. <laughs> awesome. Thank you, Aaron. Are there any other? Yep, there we go. So is assurance aimed at ensuring? Awesome. So next question is, is assurance aimed at ensuring data validity or predicting emissions outcome based on data? Both? What our, our main goal is that uh, at the end of the day, we want to make sure that the mission accomplishes uh, its objectives. Uh, we are making the assumption for that, that in order for that to occur, that this data was critical in either its timing or its integrity or both. So if we can back that up in the equation then and say, if we can show that the data is available and maintains its integrity, then the mission will be successful as long as that's what it needed. So a little bit of both. Awesome, thank you very much. Uh, are there any other questions at this time? Seems like you did a very good job explaining everything, Sarah, huh? <laughs> I was going to say, it's either that or uh, they told me I wasn't um, just the last of, just they saved the best for last. So um, I'm, I'm going to go with that and that uh, everybody's been having a really good day and has had a lot of uh, information uh, gathered from a lot of great people. Um, I will say while I'm up here, uh, oh, another question oh, cool. too. <laughs> another one. Yep, yeah, go ahead. I was going to say, uh, while, while I'm up here, I'd just like to throw out that along with this challenge and, and these great ways that uh, we're reaching out to try and, and partner with uh, new and different, different folks, um, we have a lot of other uh, ways to reach out and other areas that we're interested in. So um, as you probably saw in my, my title there, I'm, I'm the cyber S&T uh, CTC lead, which basically means I'm uh, directing and guiding the, the vision of our cyber research. Uh, at AFRLRI at, at the moment. So if there are other areas of interest too, I know part of this is networking, please feel free to, to reach out. I'm, I'm happy to engage, even if this topic and challenge isn't uh, the one you're most excited about and you have other areas of interest. Uh, we're always looking to make these connections with, with our future partners. So what do we got now? Next one, are encryption techniques of interest for data generation processing and tr transmission to ensure integrity? Example, is something like fully homomorphic encryption of interest? Uh, absolutely. I, I've been watching a uh, fully homomorphic encryption as, as it evol evolves. And uh, I was really excited when, when we were able to do the uh, um, addition and subtraction, but but the multiplication and division uh, parts of the processing uh, was uh, more difficult. So I would really like to see more about fully homomorphic encryption. That would, that would provide quite a bit of uh, assurances for our information while it's in transit and in storage, as well as processing when we're in untrusted um, gray areas, uh, clouds, like I said, that we're, we're processing on hardware we don't own and we don't know our neighbors. So that would be a great, great way to look into. Um, I'm sure there are other techniques too. Uh, there are drawbacks with homomorphic encryption as well, uh, how much we can process at any one time. And, and uh, as I said, I've been following it over the years when it was still partially homomorphic encryption uh, to see if we could get it to the point where it is uh, mission feasible for, for all of our missions or at least for some highly critical ones. Perfect, thank you very much. Thanks, Aaron, for the, uh, for the second question there.
So again, every single time I am about to say, uh, let's go to networking to have the more like intimate conversations, it seems that another question comes through. So I'm going to give it just a brief moment before, before we head to networking. So if anybody has any questions that they would like, they would like directly answered, uh, please feel free to ask those now. Well, thank you all very much. I'm looking forward to chatting with you on the tables and uh, uh, getting to know everybody a little bit better. And um, if my email is not uh, provided, uh, it's just sarah.muccio at us.af.mil. Um, very similar to uh, uh, Alvaro's that he posted just with my name instead. <laughs> awesome. So again, uh You'll be floating around during the networking session, I presume, and we'll 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 set you up at table one. And if multiple tables are filled, just feel free to jump around. But again, we're going to be heading to networking set the networking session now. I'll be renaming the tables, and we will see you all in the lounge. Wonderful, thank you. Awesome. Well, what a great afternoon. It's wonderful to have all the engagement around these topics, and I hope this has been the birthplace of some new relationships that will continue. If you're ready to jump in and work with us to match up talent, technologies, and resources to serve our airmen and guardians, the next step is for you to pitch an idea on how you can contribute to any of the challenges we've discussed here today. Just go to the Innovare website at innovare.org, click on the Aspire Challenge, pick a challenge or two, and complete the quick smart sheet. Our team will then evaluate, pair, and invite key submissions to the main event in August, where we will refine our roadmap and develop our R&D agenda to get new partners online. Anthony? Yeah, we would very much like to thank our keynote speakers and the challenge authors for the time that they've committed to this project. But most importantly, we wanna thank you for participating in this event and showing that you want to continue the vital work that makes our nation strong. I want to mention that uh, the chat, uh, the uh, chat tables, I cannot remember the exact Network. name, networking tables, sorry, <laughs> are open and available. Uh, afterward, uh, the event, they'll stay open for a little bit. So if you are having some conversations, you can go back and, and have them. Uh, thank you and uh, have a good night.